Hello, welcome to the Sound of Science, the place where we deconstruct unscientific bogus and silly scams. Let's go get them. Hello, my fellow critical thinkers. Welcome back to another video in which we finally take on the former professor of the University of Oxford and most profound Christian thinker in the world, John Lennox. At least, from what I've heard, many Christians see John Lennox as their ultimate intellectual champion. Go listen to John Lennox. He will crush your arguments, they keep telling me. This is a man who many Christians think destroyed Richard Dawkins in a debate about evolution, so it's about time to see if John Lennox really is what his fans claim he is. And I've been looking forward to finally take the opportunity to analyze the arguments of John Lennox because I've been debunking the silly nonsense of people like Frank Turek, Ray Comfort and William Lane Craig for over a year now and none of them offered me any challenge. That's not because of me, that is because of their arguments. Those arguments prove nothing and are often laughable. Anyone who finished high school can debunk those charlatans. All you need to do is sit down, listen to their words, let those words sink in and analyze what they say step by step and in full detail. When people like Frank Turek, Ray Comfort and William Lane Craig engage in life debates, they spout their nonsense at a very high pace. They make unsubstantiated claims in about every sentence that makes it pointless to engage with them in that format because the time frame does not allow for you to address all of their bogus so then they get away with huge quantities of hogwash but luckily there is YouTube and YouTube allows me to dissect their gibberish step by step and in full detail and that is exactly what I'm going to do with John Lennox in this video and of course I hope that he is in a different class than the apologist fools I mentioned earlier. In this video I will discuss the lecture of John Lennox at the University of Oxford which is titled God Does Exist. Lennox delivered that lecture in November of 2012 and it is often referred to by Christian apologists as one of the strongest pleas for the existence of a God. So let's see what Lennox has got to tell us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I believe in God. I believe in the supernatural God who created the heavens and the earth. I believe in a God who holds the heavens and the earth in existence. I believe that on the basis of rational evidence, similar to the beliefs held by the founders of this house who gave this university the motto, Dominus Illuminatio Mea. They saw no contradiction between faith in God and the utmost excellence in rational inquiry. Wow, that already is a bad start. First, John Lennox explains what he believes, and then he continues to say that his beliefs are based upon rational evidence. But then, the first thing he does is using an argument from authority, which is a pretty low bar logical fallacy. He tells us that the founders of the University of Oxford would agree with him that a god exists. So what? If Lennox is the profound thinker that his fans claim he is, then he should know that it is completely irrelevant what the founders of the University of Oxford thought about the existence of a god. Whatever they thought is irrelevant to the actual existence of a god and can in no way be seen as rational evidence for anything, especially not since the founders of the University of Oxford lived more than 900 years ago, centuries before modern science was established in the Western world. So, no, that was not a very good start. It was a waste of 30 seconds of everybody's time but let's continue and see if John Lennox will present some actual rational evidence 
for the existence of a God. Let's see if he will keep his promise. And if I dare mention my alma mater of Cambridge in this holy place, I would remind you that on the door of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge are written the words, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. So, another argument from authority. That's number two now. It's totally irrelevant what is written on the doors of the University of Cambridge. Mr. Lennox, you are a mathematician. You surely understand that this does not prove anything and it kind of degrades your plea as a whole by starting off with two arguments from authority. You're now two points down in this match. And as we look at the, at the rise of science in the 16th and 17th centuries, Alfred North Whitehead and many others commented that men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in the lawgiver. So, I'm kind of astonished now. One of the supposedly greatest Christian minds in the world, Mr. John Lennox, is promising us rational evidence for the existence of a God, and he starts off by using three arguments from authority in a row. Wow, that is disappointing. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not ashamed of being both a scientist and a Christian, because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. But you, not being ashamed for believing in the existence of a God, again proves nothing about the existence of a God. I'm now getting a bit impatient. Please present us the rational evidence for the existence of your God, as you promised us. What I am amazed at is that serious thinkers today continue to ask us to choose between God and science. No, I'm not asking you to choose between God and science. I'm asking you to present your rational evidence for the existence of your God, as you promised us. When Newton discovered his law of gravity, he didn't say, I've got a law. I don't need God. No, he wrote the Principia Mathematica, arguably the greatest work in the whole history of science, because he saw that God is not the same kind of explanation as a scientific explanation. God doesn't compete. Agency does not compete with mechanism and law. You are drifting away more and more from your initial promise. You're now trying to bend your lecture into some sort of narrative in favor of the idea that people can believe in a god and be a mathematician at the same time. We know that, but that doesn't prove that a god exists. It only proves that people like you exist. Why is there something rather than nothing? Ah, why is there something rather than nothing? Ladies and gentlemen, this question is a trick. It's a language trick to lure you into believing something that has not been proven to exist. And I think I've never before heard someone producing a comprehensive debunk of this trick. So if even someone like John Lennox is using this trick, then it's about time someone should expose it. And I guess that will be me. Why is there something rather than nothing? Is a language trick that is so subtle that most people do not notice it. The trick revolves around the double meaning of the word why. You see, the word why can ask for the mechanism that explains some material event or physical situation. But the word why can also ask for a motivation or an intention that someone had for doing something. For example, when I ask you, why did the apple fall from the tree? You are expecting the kind of answer like, well, the wind was blowing and that put so much force on the stem of the apple that it snapped. And then of course the apple fell to the ground. So the laws of physics are such that these events happen. So when I ask you why the apple fell to the ground, you expect me to explain the physical mechanism that caused the apple to fall. What you don't expect me to say is, well, the apple has been hanging there for months now. 
and the apple thought it was time for something new, and that's why he decided to detach from the tree and fall to the ground. We don't expect any kind of motivation or intention from the apple itself because the apple hasn't got brains so it can't think for itself. Actually, if the question why did the apple fall to the ground was meant to ask for the motivation and intention of the apple, the question wouldn't make any sense because that question would imply the existence of something that we know doesn't exist. An apple doesn't think, so asking for its motivation to fall from a tree would be a nonsense question. But when I ask you why did the man throw the apple, it's the other way around because we know that the man does have brains. There might have been some kind of specific intention or motivation for him to throw that apple. So then we might expect an answer like he threw that apple so that it would end up in the basket where he was collecting the other apples. What we don't expect is an answer that explains the physical mechanism behind him throwing the apple. So we don't expect the answer to be, well, his muscles responded to his brain activity. So that is why he threw the apple. So in these examples of these two questions, why did the apple fall to the ground and why did the man throw the apple? The word why has two distinct different meanings. And in case of the apple, we immediately understand that difference. But now ask me a much more complicated question. Why is there something rather than nothing? This question very cleverly exploits the ambiguity of the word why. When we hear the question why is there something rather than nothing, our brain starts to think very rapidly and tries to figure out what the meaning of the word why is in this specific question. Is someone asking us to explain the physical mechanism that explains how the universe got into existence? That would be a question for cosmologists to answer. Or, just like the example with the apple, is this question perhaps implying that there was a motivation or an intent behind the universe coming into existence. And of course, that is exactly what a Christian apologist wants you to believe. If that was the meaning of the question, asking for an intent or a motivation behind the universe coming into existence, then the question is implying the existence of something that has not been proven to be real. There is no evidence to suggest that there is meaning and intent behind the universe coming into existence. So that version of the question, just like with the example of the falling apple, is a nonsense question. That version of the question is very subtly implying that there is a motivation and intent behind the universe coming into existence. And all we need to do now is figure out what that motivation and intent are and from whom they originated. The question itself very subtly tries to make you believe that without ever providing any shred of evidence that such a thing could be true. So whenever someone asks you, why is there something rather than nothing? then tell them that there is something rather than nothing for the same reason why an apple falls to the ground. The laws of physics are such that events like these happen. Of course, a Christian apologist won't be satisfied with that answer, so then they might want to steer the conversation into the direction of the other version of the why question. So then they might get more specific and ask you, what was the motivation and the intent behind the universe coming into existence? And then, of course, you could continue with the apple example and ask them if they think that the apple had motivation and intent to fall from the tree. And if not, then why would there be a motivation and intent behind the universe coming into existence? They just claim it, and by asking their question, they didn't prove anything. It's just a nonsense question, just like asking what the motivation behind a falling apple is. All right, I think that was a pretty comprehensive debunk of the nonsensical why is there something rather than nothing question. It took a bit of time, but let's go back to John Lennox, who up to now didn't prove anything other than that he doesn't mind using arguments from authority and nonsense questions. Alan Sandage, the brilliant cosmologist who became a Christian in his 50s, said God is the answer to that question. Shocking. Another argument from authority. That would be number four now. 
It's totally irrelevant what this cosmologist said, and it's irrelevant that he converted to Christianity. It simply proves nothing about the existence of a god. Will you finally start presenting your rational evidence for the existence of a god? But people are now so desperate to show that the universe created itself from nothing, which well, seems to me to be an immediate oxymoron. Who is desperate? How did you establish that? And how is that relevant to anything? And how does it prove the existence of your God? And why do you totally misrepresent the Big Bang Theory? Because that is what you're doing here. Nobody believes that everything came from nothing. Nobody claims that. There is only Christian apologists, like yourself, pretending that there are people who claim this. So, after presenting his four arguments from authority, you're now switching to straw man arguments. You make up positions that people never took, and then you attack those positions that nobody ever took, which proves nothing apart from you using questionable debating tricks. This truly makes me sad. This man is supposedly one of the greatest Christian thinkers of our time. And what does he do? He presents the same stupid logical fallacies that have been debunked a million times before. If I say X created Y, I'm assuming the existence of X to explain the existence of Y. If I say X created X, I'm assuming the existence of X to explain the existence of X which simply shows that nonsense remains nonsense even if high-powered scientists utter it. But, Mr. Lennox, that situation only exists in your fantasy. Nobody claims that X created X. Why don't you give us real-life examples of scientists who claim that X created X? You don't do that because those examples don't exist which makes this part of your plea another straw man argument. So that is your second straw man argument. It reminds me a little bit of G.K. Chesterton, who said, It is absurd to complain that it is unthinkable for an unthinkable God to make everything out of nothing, and then to pretend that it is more thinkable that nothing should turn itself into everything. What an utter disappointment. Nobody ever claimed that nothing created everything. It's one of the most pathetic straw man arguments in the book. And it is a true deception that someone with your reputation is degrading his own legacy by applying such charlatanist reasoning. You're now at four arguments from authority and three straw man arguments. This is bad news. The heavens declare the glory of God, says the ancient psalm. What? So you're now even giving us a Bible quote? which of course proves nothing other than that Bible quotes exist. Up to now, your arguments cannot be distinguished from the most silly arguments of the thousands of butchered apologist fools who populate YouTube. What's next, Mr. Lennox? A flat earth? And we've unraveled a bit of that, seeing the fine-tuning of the fundamental forces of nature. It's something that's so striking to scientists that it demands explanation. Oh yeah, sure. The fine-tuning argument. I should have known. You're really pulling all the usual Christian apologist BS from the shelves now. The only fine-tuning in that argument is the careful way that Christian apologists label this argument. Fine-tuning that implies a thinking agent who deliberately is tuning and tweaking the universe. And that was the whole thing the argument should prove in the first place. But by calling your argument the fine-tuning argument, you don't prove that fine-tuning exists. You only pretend it. Oh, boy. And it seems to me that Arno Penzias hit it right. He is the Nobel Prize winner who discovered the microwave background on which a lot of the evidence for the Big Bang is based. He said astronomy leads us to a unique event a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Wait, another argument from authority. That's number five. So, a guy who won a Nobel Prize says there must be some supernatural plan. Are you sure you're a scientist? Because a real scientist would understand that none of what you've said so far proves anything about the existence of a god. Okay, so I'm going to give you one final chance to present your rational evidence for the existence of your god, as you promised. 
I'm running out of patience here. But I want to come to what I think is one of the fundamental arguments for theism. Oh, okay, cool. So we're now getting to your most important argument. Finally, give it your best shot. How is it that a mathematician thinking in her head in here can come up with equations that seem to fit the universe out there? Well, how is it indeed? Because the irony of the atheist position here is evident. My atheist friends, and I have many of them, tell me that the driving force of evolution, which eventually produced our human cognitive faculties, reason included, was not primarily concerned with truth at all, but with survival. And we all know, ladies and gentlemen, what has often happened and still happens to truth when individuals or commercial enterprises or nations feel themselves threatened and struggle for survival. Sweet mother of Gandalf, what a disappointment. You now even start misrepresenting atheism. Atheism has got nothing to do with evolution. You know that. So why do you act as if you don't know? All atheism is, is not believing that a god exists. And it doesn't even stop there because you also misrepresent the process of evolution. Evolution is not concerned with survival. Evolution is not concerned with anything. Evolution is just a natural process. It has no goals. It is not aiming for anything. So, however you try to frame evolution here as some immoral struggle for survival, it really only shows your dishonesty. Mr. Lennox, I'm truly astonished you have displayed such a nonsensical charade of non-arguments that I can take this gibberish no longer. I'm deeply disappointed by your performance, and therefore I'm going to treat you the exact same way I treat all the other failing Christian apologists that I encounter. I'm now five minutes into your 15-minute lecture, and this is where I'm going to stop. You promised us rational arguments for the existence of your God, but in the first five minutes of your lecture, all you gave us were five arguments from authority and four strawman arguments. And then, as the icing on the cake, you misrepresented atheism and you misrepresented evolution. I think it's really disappointing that you use the University of Oxford as your platform for such a low bar debating trickery. Perhaps I will continue to listen to the rest of your lecture some other time in the future, but for now, I need some time to recover from this disappointment. Will I ever encounter one honest Christian apologist who makes a true, credible case for the existence of their God, using actual, rational arguments and verifiable evidence that truly proves the existence of their God? I'm very doubtful that that is ever going to happen. If even a man like John Lennox is not capable of doing such a thing, then what else is left? But while I'm trying to recover from this silly charade, perhaps you should just subscribe to my channel, because then you will help me to make more videos in which I will expose silly apologists charlatans. And unfortunately, as I discovered today, even John Lennox seems to be one of them.